You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we've got talent in the background of a fab fact. We're getting into the salvage business in the randomizer. And get ready for Toy Poloi Part 2. Oh, that's all coming up in Pod 187. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Richard, I'm feeling yes? a little bit like I've had a limb cut off. Oh no, what's happened? Well, Have you had a limb cut off? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, oh, I said limb was never actually attached to me in any way. <laughs> uh, okay. But uh, it's, it's the absence of Terry Adlam that I'm feeling. Because yes! obviously we had Terry yes! back for our New Year's episode and now he's gone. Yeah, I know. So, it's just you and me I know. having to fill the void. <laughs> you can guarantee this one will be slightly less funny. Uh, as a result. <laughs> yeah. Is that fair? Aww. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's fair to say. He does bring the gags. He does. Well, uh, thank you, Terry, and a Terry New Year and Terry Christmas, and I'm sure Terry Absolutely. will be back for our next Christmas episode. Anyway, it's not Christmas now. Ooh, I it's, a, so. it's a brand-ish nope. New Year. Yeah, yeah. Second episode in. I'm Jamie Anderson, and uh, you are... I'm still Richard James. That's a relief. Yeah. And uh, Through it all. Through everything. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, and over there... Strange he's oh, practising yeah. his handstands. I'm not sure why. Oh, he is, isn't he? I mean, he's doing quite no. well. He's still doing them against the wall, though. Uh, is, yes. uh, is the randomizer himself, Chris Dale. Uh, now, Chris will be here later on with, with his feature, which is the randomizer, where he randomly watches a random yeah. episode of a random Jerry Anderson series and random episode and gives us his yeah. not-so-random thoughts and insights and humorous quips. Yeah. And hopefully the, all these handstands will help the blood flow to his brain and make this week's randomizer even wittier than usual. <laughs> That'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, I have to say, it is, despite our best efforts, Jamie, it is still remains and always will be the most popular part of the Jerry Anderson podcast. It's true, uh, isn't it? Yes, and rightly so. Yeah. I mean, the, the opening yeah. theme goes down a treat, but... Yes, yes. Other that's than true. that, yeah. it's Chris. Now, Richard, I hope you don't mind, but today, sporadically, mm-hmm. I'm going to be sharing reviews of the Space 1999 Moonbase Alpha Technical Manual. Oh. Uh, because a lot of people on the team worked very, very hard on it, did an amazing yep. job, and now people are getting yep. it and are very, very happy with it. So I that, know. that yeah. makes me very happy I'm... and proud of the team. So yes, time I'm... to share. What? I've seen all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, people posting the pictures when it, when it arrived and yeah. saying how wonderful they thought it was. Great. Well, I look forward to those reviews. Yeah, I'm right sure too. they'll all be sparkling. Uh, well, I, I hope so. Now, I will just caveat this by saying I know some of you are still waiting for your special editions. How frustrating. Ah, I'm terribly sorry yeah. about that. We have had a few go walkies uh, oh, no. now returned. A few okay. that went to Stansted to be flown out to the U.S., and then oh. just sat there and have been oh. returned. And we don't know why. FedEx won't tell us what's happened there. Um, oh. So we've had a few nightmares. We are working to get it resolved as quickly as possible. Do not worry. Yeah. If you haven't got your special edition yet and you pre-ordered one, then it is safe and it will be with you as soon as we can possibly get it to you. Um, oh, okay. But uh, any worries or whatever, do email us, support at jerryanderson.com and the team will uh, reassure you and let you know any updates. So apologies yeah. for that. We managed to get out nearly 3,000 of these books um, over the Christmas period and a very small number probably less than 50 have had problems so if you're one of those affected apologies okay however yeah yeah can I just well. share with you this uh, review from Rich M in the US who says five Go stars on. an absolute must have for Space 1999 fans I never got one published in the 1970s but I made sure to get this one and I'm glad I did oh fantastic well, that's Very nice, nice, isn't it? Anyway, yeah. this uh, podcast doesn't normally include product reviews, but I, again, it's a, it's a matter <laughs> of pride, and I'm very proud of the team because they did a fantastic job, and there will be more of these to come. Uh, but Richard James, what else, yes. other than Chris's handstands and random reviews, can we expect in this 187th episode of the Jerry Anderson Podcast? 
Wow, crikey, 187. Well, we have, of course, got uh, all the usual gubbins coming up in today's Jerry Anderson podcast. We've got uh, emails, uh, Facebook musings and tweets from our lovely podstrons. They've been emailing us at jerryanderson at podcast. No, they've been emailing us <laughs> at podcast at jerryanderson.com. <laughs> you can tell he's out of practice. Happy New Year, Dickie. <laughs> it's been a while, isn't it? Um, uh, we've also got, oh, I think it's the second part of your interview uh, with Toy Poloi. With Dave from uh, Toy Poloi, yes. Later on, that's right, yeah. Uh, we've got newsy news, 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 I suspect, because yes. you can bet your bottom dollar that there's brand new stuff happening in the Jerry Anderson universe, and we'll be bringing you news of that. And, of course, it may be a new year, and you may be making all sorts of New Year's resolutions about changing things in your life, but some things remain the same, mm. like fab facts. Hooray! Hooray! <laughs> yes, Fab Facts will uh, be along just uh, in a few moments, I think. Yes, and I think that's about the size of it, isn't it? I'm sure I haven't missed anything out. Good. Must be it. No, I think you're yeah. right. Uh, before we go into Fab Facts, though, I'm going to share this from Andrew R. in Australia about the uh, Moonbase yes. Alpha Technical Manual. He says, if you are a Space 1999 fan, then this is the book for you. Beautifully illustrated and very informative. I absolutely love it. A big thank you to all those that played a part in making this book a reality. Uh, I absolutely share your sentiments, Andrew. Uh, Chris, AC. Oh, uh, wonderful. Team yeah. Amazing 15, Steve, the editor, and everybody else. Amazing job. Thank you very much. Well done. Now, Without further ado, yes. do you mind if I force oh, us yes. straight into uh, a lovely feast of fab facts? Go on then, squeeze it in. Now, time for this week's fab facts. Yes, indeed, it's fab facts where I've got a book of fab facts. Here's me slapping the book. <laughs> well, just in case you didn't believe it was really here, I flip through the book, Richard Shouts Fab, at a random point, and it is very random indeed. I stop on a page and we hope to happen upon a fab fact. Richard, are you ready to fab me? Yes. I'm ready to flick at you. Here we go. Born ready. <laughs> Here we go. Fab! Ah, ha, 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 ha. Mm-hmm. Well, Richard oh. James, you're a bit of a closet fan. Actually, you're not a closet. You're just a bit of a Doctor <laughs> Who fan, aren't you? Well, I mean, I was wondering where that sentence was going. Yes, I am, as it yeah. happens. Absolutely not, not a closet one. In fact, your closet is full of uh, of Doctor Who cosplay items, am I correct? Yeah, scarves, cricket jumpers, it's yes. all in there. And you wear them very well. Anyway, uh, today's Fab Fact brings together the John Pertwee era of Doctor Who. Oh, yes. And Space 1999. Oh, yes. And another cult 70s TV series, The New Avengers. Love it. Now, eagle-eyed Space 1999 viewers... See what I did there? Uh, eagle oh. eye. <laughs> eagle eye. Mm, thank you very much. May have spotted some relatively prominent Doctor Who guest stars from the John Pertwee era appearing as extras in Space 1999's first season. These included Joy Harrison, who played Jill Tarrant in Death to the Daleks. Uh, mm-hmm. She was in the background of Main Mission in a couple of episodes, but never had any lines. Mm-hmm. Paul Grist, who played Bill Filer in The Claws of Axos. He also mm. appeared in Space 1999 in one scene of The Last Sunset as a non-speaking eagle pilot. Oh. That brings us to an eagle pilot who did have one line in the episode Guardian of Piri, played by an uncredited actor who subsequently went on to greater fame after his time on 99 and Doctor Who. So, right. Richard, which actor played Arak in Planet of the Spiders? Planet of the Spiders, John Pertwee's last story, yeah. 1974. Arak. I mean, I do have a name at the tip of my tongue, but I'm not sure it's the right name. So, <laughs> shall I shall I chance it, or are you just going to plough on? No, chance it. I want to say Gareth Hunt. You are correct. It was oh, none other well, than well. future New Avengers star Gareth Hunt. Ah, yes. Now, he was originally cast as Eagle pilot Pete Irving in the episode Guardian of Piri. However, it appears Gareth didn't get on with the director of that episode, Charles Crichton, and left the production. Uh, the role of Ooh. Irving was then recast with actor Michael Culver. However, Gareth still briefly appears in the finished episode because, as you will no doubt recall, Richard, everybody on Alpha has been brainwashed in the episode and relocated to the paradise planet of Piri until oh, yeah, yeah. Commander Koenig comes down and wrecks the Guardian that's holding everything together. 
So, yeah. um, yes, you, you know it. So when the planet begins to disintegrate at the end of the story, everybody races back to the eagles to abandon the planet, and Gareth Hunt is one of the Alphans seen taking controls of an eagle. Aha! Now, obviously, when Gareth was replaced with Michael Culver, they presumably would have reshot any scenes featuring Irving that had already been filmed with Gareth. But in the case of that one shot, yeah. doesn't really matter who Gareth is meant to be. He's just an Alphan among the 300 who are scrabbling to escape the planet. So it was kept yeah. in rather than waste time calling uh, Michael Culver in to reshoot it as Irving. Thus began Enough. and ended Gareth Hunt's career in the Anderson universe, uh, which went only slightly better than that of his New Avengers co-star, Joanna Lumley, who, as you will probably remember and was discussed on a previous Fab Fact, uh, auditioned for UFO, but didn't get the part. Yes! And then did get a part in The Protectors, uh, and then it got right. cut. <laughs> yeah. Poor Joanna yeah, Lumley. I'm sure she has got over it by now. <laughs> Poor Dame Joanna Lumley. Oh, yeah, uh, yes, yes, D- Dame, <laughs> Dame Lumley. Uh, anyway, but how strange that Space 1999 was hiring people who had prominent speaking roles on other shows just to play background extras. That's really odd, yes. It could possibly speak to the difference in budget between the two shows. Doctor Who had Paul Grist and Joy Harrison money, but 1999 had Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee money. Ah. Uh, now, speaking of extras, we should also mention the likes of Max Faulkner, Mike Stevens, Roy Scammell, Terry Walsh, Nick Hobbs, and Harry Fielder. Uh, those are names you may not recognise unless you're a fan, but you'll probably recognise the faces from various shows of that era, including Doctor Who, uh, where they did stunts for John Pertwee's and Tom Baker's era. They too turned up in 1999 and other live-action Anderson productions. So, Podstrons, oh. we're turning this one over yeah. to you. Where else in the Anderson universe have you spotted a famous face picking up extra work as a background artist? Uh, let us know, podcast at jerryanderson.com. And before people go for the obvious answers, no, Idris Elba mm. and Ray Winston's Space Precinct appearances don't qualify <laughs> because they were credit ge- credited guest actors despite the fact yes. that they didn't have their own voices anymore. Yes. Interesting. Uh, I mean, two things strike me from that fab fact. Only two. Firstly, well, as you mentioned there, <laughs> maybe it was a difference in budget, but getting, you know, kind of uh, normally featured actors to play supporting roles, supporting artists or extras, essentially, mm. that's very unusual. Yes, it is, isn't uh, it? But I, yeah, but I suppose, you know, if you were a regular gigging actor and maybe you'd had a guest part in Doctor Who a couple of years ago and you were offered potentially, you know, twice the money for five days at Pinewood to not say any lines, you'd do it, wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you take it? Yeah. And secondly, for Gareth Hunt to leave a production because he'd fallen out with the director, Mm. I mean, there's a story there. That's a big deal to walk away, uh, no matter who you are, from a production that you've started work on because you've fallen out with the director. That's a big deal. So I wonder what happened there. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, normally... People manage to see these things through, don't they? And then just yeah, go and of psych them off afterwards. Exactly. Particularly if it's just a guest role for one episode, you kind of grin and bear it for a couple of weeks. Yeah. So well, does anybody know so why they fell out? Mm. Is there a story published anywhere? Is it, you know, has somebody been interviewed and said, oh, yeah, I didn't get on with Charles. He uh, yes. made a rude joke about the size of my feet. Exactly. <clears throat> or perhaps it was the way Charles Crichton made his coffee. You know, because Gareth Hunt, he likes his coffee in a particular way, as you'll know. Uh, y- yes. I, I know, you don't know what I'm talking that. about. No, I'm totally lost. Can you can, can, can you educate me? Well, he went he went on famously, I think, to uh, star in the Nescafe uh, coffee adverts. I think it was Nescafe with the beans that he used to shake the beans. Oh, was that him? The bean that shaker. That's Gareth Hunt. That the bean shaker. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. You learn something new every day here at the Jerry Anderson podcast, see, I, whether you I, like I, it or I not. I brought you my own fab facts <laughs> for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Anyway, uh, there's nothing more I can learn from this. I think we've uh, wrung out as much detail as we can, but do email us podcast yeah. at jerryanderson.com if you've got any other uncredited background artists who were, were well known elsewhere. We'd love to hear your thoughts. But for now, that is the end of this week's Hunt Fact. Uh, yes! You can tell. <laughs> we we're, both went for it. We're, we're back on form now. New, new yeah. year, new energy, uh, new Fab Facts outro. Right, great. Uh, now, talking of people emailing in to podcast at jerryanderson.com, people have been emailing in to podcast at jerryanderson.com. Oh. Would you like to hear some of the emails? I would. And at some point, now, tell me yeah. when you would like another review and I'll insert <gasps> one of those. 
Great. All right. I'll absolutely do that. Now, we've got quite a few to get through here because, uh, you know, I think it's no secret to say that we, we sort of pre-recorded a few uh, podcasts over the Christmas and New Year period. And as a result, I've got a bit of a backlog of emails like this Ooh. one, for example, uh, from Brenton Smith from Adelaide in South Australia, who says, Hi, Jamie, Richard and Sir Dale. Uh, just letting you know, a recent anime called Didn't I Say to Make My Abilities Average in the Next Life uh, this year features in the final episode whilst the characters were in a temple uh, looking for an ancient race, coming across some carvings depicting some powerful machines. Two carvings showed Thunderbird 3 and Thunderbird 5. And he attached a screenshot showing them. Uh, this shows that there are still Japanese fans of the shows still working in the business in Japan. Keep up with the fun podcast from Brenton Smith. It's interesting, Brenton. Isn't it? Goodness me, yeah. <clears throat> you never know where these influences are going to crop up. No, that's right. Uh, Trevor Knight says, Dear Jamie, Richard and Chris, I discovered the Jerry Anderson podcast about 18 months ago. Trevor, oh. where have you been? Gosh. Yeah. Uh, but he does say he's been a fan ever since, so that's fair enough. As a child in the 60s, he says, I grew up watching Jerry's TV shows and I've loved them ever since. They're brilliant, exciting and inspiring, and your podcasts have brought back so many wonderful memories and made me love the worlds of Jerry Anderson even more. I'm really looking forward to joining you at the Stand By For Action concert in April. It Hurrah. promises to be a highlight of the year. In the meantime, thank you for another year of wonderful podcasts from Trevor. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, Hugh Porter has been in touch. Now, he says, hello, Richard and Jamie. This may be late, depending on which podcast you may read it on, but Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Oh, thank you, Hugh. I mean, yeah, we could still get away with that. Uh, just emailing in to say, after deep searching upon the internet, I finally managed to score the Captain Scarlet Spectrum File 1 on Amazon. It was the second to last copy available, and I was so happy to complete the three-volume set. Also, I can't wait for the year ahead with new Jerry Anderson content being created and developed as we speak. Brackets, Stingray soundtrack soon, please. And that's from Hugh Porter. Mm. So, what are the chances? Uh, well, as you know by now, Stingray on Blu-ray is on its way. Yes. Uh, Stingray Blu-ray on way. Uh, I like it. And I wouldn't be surprised, surely, if yeah. the soundtrack was somewhere yeah. nearby. I mean, there's certainly going to be a, a, a little... Um, uh, is it a seven inch i guess on the mm -hmm. uh on the super deluxe version from network um, okay which i have actually heard some of the of remasters of oh gorgeous mm. it has never sounded so good newly remastered by some very 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 talented people and uh gosh yes yeah, sounds better than ever how, how i mean barry barry would love to hear it how it is now uh, so i'm yeah, sure great. there must be some soundtrack stuff on the way very very soon Oh, lovely. Uh, Scott By says, Greetings, Jamie, Richard and Chris. Just wanted to recommend a YouTube channel that you might be interested in having a look at. Uh, it's by Japanese YouTuber Kan Koba, which is K-A-N-K-O-B-A. -A. Uh, he's been creating working miniature builds of the Thunderbird hangers and launch bays. Hmm. And again, Scott attached a, a screenshot with his email. It looks amazing. So do go to YouTube and look for Kan Koba and have a look at those. Uh, we've also heard from Peter Lawrence who says, uh, interesting information about Derek Meddings and ZPG. Uh, oh, remind yes. us of that, Jamie. Uh, that was the film, the lower budget film that Derek did the special effects for. I yes. Uh, uh, Peter says, it reminds me of Soylent Green. Uh, this was a 1974 film in the States. The world was so overpopulated that people could choose pleasant euthanasia and be turned into food, green food, made by the Soylent Company. This was one of the series of Charlton Heston dystopian films in that era. The sci-fi theme of Too Many People, The End Is Nigh probably came from Paul Ehrlich's 1968 book. Jerry Anderson's positive view of the future predates Star Trek and seems fairly unique in sci-fi. The need for drama and antagonism in storytelling probably drives creatives towards the easier solution of dystopian visions. Creating suspense in a generally positive context is much harder, uh, says Peter. We saw how that can fail with uh, the Thunderbirds 2004 movie. Mm. Uh, I had the chance to meet Jerry, says Peter, in 2002. He was on a DVD tour over here. Uh, also met uh, Ed Bishop at a toy store in Santa Monica in 1973. He wore a blonde wig for the occasion. Oh, I've got a picture <laughs> of that. Have you? Amazingly, yes. Great. 
Nice. How funny. It's going above and beyond, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and a final one here from David Barry, who says, Hi, Jamie, Richard and Chris. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Chris for his present to us all doppelganger yes. on the randomizer. I hung on to every word and note. Barry Gray's contribution to the film is enormous. His incidental music, particularly for the film developing sequence at the beginning of the movie, is so perfectly fitting to the visuals that you can listen to it and see every one of Herbert Lom's actions playing out in your head. <laughs> I've always felt that when it came to the recognition that he so richly deserved, Barry Gray was penalised for his association with Jerry uh, and his puppet shows. It seems so wrong that Barry didn't even get an award nomination for Doppelganger, whilst 2001 was nominated for Best Original Score. Well, he says, we Podstrons all loved your contributions, Barry, and I, for one, can't wait to hear Doppelganger at Standby for Action on April the 16th. Jamie... Uh, he says, how about some special merch just for the show? Some snug-fitting face masks with either the Wasp logo or the original Spectrum logo. Have a wonderful 2022. Best wishes from David. Ah, oh, thanks, now, David. I mean, have you got a playlist yet for the uh, the concert in April? Oh, yes, I've got the programme. I'm not telling you what's on it. Oh, oh curses. Just to say that, you know, it's as complete, or it's more complete than anything you've heard before. That's, let's say Lovely. that much, shall we? Okay great there you go uh, yeah that's all our emails for now plenty more coming next week of course but in the meantime do keep them coming into podcast at jerryanderson.com and i'll read them out again excellent uh, also yeah. do keep hmm. uh enjoying the Moonbase alpha technical manual i've got two more reviews right here from across the pond Lovely. Uh, go on heading up to canada for daniel c he says every page is very detailed and its information is so well presented thank you for this awesome book uh, and then down to the us timothy w Wow. Beautiful, superbly illustrated, chock full of great information, goes well beyond the show and introduces us to some great behind the scenes activities and hardware on Alpha. An incredible piece of work and well worth it. Lovely. Wow. Thank yeah. you very much, Timothy. And those continue and I'll be sharing more with you in a little bit. That's great. I mean, I know it's rather like your children is you can't really pick out a favourite child, but do you think it's probably the pinnacle of what the Jerry Anderson <laughs> store produced yet and Chris Thompson and I'm, all the I'm other contributors? Certainly, I think, you know, uh, all the stuff that people have learned and the, the things that yeah. we've developed over the last few years have, have you know, culminated in this. But yeah. this is certainly not the peak. There, are, there you sure. know, It's a false peak, if anything. There's more peaky things to come. <laughs> uh, sort of weird Feeling hiking peaky myself. Me metaphor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. For that. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, I'll be yeah, sharing okay. some more reviews with you later on. In the meantime, I think it might be some time for some Jerry Anderson news. Oh. It's the Jerry Anderson New Z News. New Year Z News. News, news, news. news. Yeah, but we've already had that last week. Oh, well, right. Well, News Z News 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 then. Thank you very much. I was waiting for you to join in there. It just seems weird now. Anyway, uh, now, uh, as you all know, uh, it's early in the new year, but there's still things happening, of course. Uh, I've already Hooray. been telling you about the Moonbase Alpha Technical Manual, which is in stock and shipping. And like I said, I'm very sorry if you're waiting for your special edition. We had to rescue them from uh, Stanford Airport, now rescued and uh, winging their way to the US. They will be with you as soon as physically possible. Thank you for your patience, but they're very safe. Uh, if you're looking to pick up some bargains, you know people do these sort of January sale type things. Well, yeah, they do, yeah. Yeah, well, we're doing one as well. But oh. uh, it's for one week only. And in fact, by the time you're hearing this, it's already a few days in. Up until the 14th of April... Uh, 14th of April? No, that's, uh, really? that's another that's another thing coming up shortly. Up until the 14th oh. of January, <laughs> okay. uh, you can save 20% on a range of bits and pieces. And also, uh, we are saying goodbye to nearly 70 different T-shirt designs, which are coming to the oh. end of the road. Uh, yeah, they're running yeah. out of runway. Yeah. They're quickly heading down the tracks towards destruction in a sort of monorail kind of a way. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so they are disappearing. So you have just a few days left to grab those designs before they go away forever to make room for more incoming cool stuff. Lots of you have also been enjoying the UFO comic anthology, volume one. Thank mm -hmm. you for your fantastic feedback on that. I could also do some reviews on that, but I'll leave that for next week. Uh, yeah, sure. Lots of you have been asking, when's Volume 2 coming? Uh, we are aiming uh, for the mid or middle of end of April, middle or end oh, okay. of April this year. Oh, so nice. not long to wait, more previews and stuff coming in due course with some rather lovely additions uh, in this second volume 
kind of really taking it towards complete completist status. Nice. Uh, I think you'll be very chuffed with what's in there. Yeah. Uh, Thunderbird's Peril in Peru is in stock, the hardback and the CD, and they are shipping now. We are quickly running out of CDs, uh, so yeah. if you do want a CD copy, grab one now, and we'll soon be announcing the next publishing venture, the next audio and hardback release, which I can tell you now will be a Stingray title. <laughs> Oh, and it has a very, very cool cover. Very, very cool. Um, Great. That has been edited and I'm pretty sure delivered. So, uh, yes, uh, more news on that very, very soon. Uh, and, of course, we've got all these things coming up in April. Jerry Anderson Day on the 14th of April. Uh, the same day when the documentary Jerry Anderson, A Life Uncharted, is released on BritBox. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll also be doing a few cinema dates there. And then, of course, as already mentioned, Stand By For Action, the, uh, the concert at the Birmingham Symphony Hall. Do make sure you grab your tickets. Uh, I'm sure a few of you will be thinking, oh, but what about, you know, all the C word stuff? I mean, COVID, mm. obviously. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, if for any reason, uh, for obviously safety, because your safety and health are of primary concern to us, if we have to move the date, your tickets will be honoured for a later date, or you can get a full refund from the box office at Birmingham Symphony yeah. Hall. Um, so, you know, please don't worry about that side of things. Uh, uh, Birmingham Symphony Hall will put in appropriate measures to whatever their current guidance is at the time, uh, so everybody will be uh, looked after and safe. So. I mean, yeah, and still quite a way off, of course. Still, you know, sort of four months to go, so might be all changed by then. Uh, yeah, 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 three, three, and, half, three and a half months is, you know, yeah. things could be really eased up by then. Uh, but, yeah, it'll be a lovely night. Everyone's going to have a great yeah. time, and uh, I yeah. do hope you can come and join us. Uh, there's lots more news to come. But not today. I had a little bit of a rushed lunch. I've got a little bit of indigestion. So I oh think dear. it's probably time to say that's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. Rushed lunch indigestion news. I mean, <laughs> that'll teach you, won't it? Don't rush your lunch. Well, you heard me doing it at the start of this I recording. Did. <laughs> dear, true. oh dear. Not good. Yeah. Now, a quick word to our lovely listeners. Please do remember that you can subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on right now. And that means that you'll be sure to hear each new episode of the podcast on the very day that it drops. You can also leave us a nice review and a rating. And we'd really appreciate it if you, if you do that. And also copy the link to all your socials and let your friends know that you're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast too. Uh, now, over on our Facebook group, people have been getting involved in all sorts of shenanigans over Christmas and New Year, but are now settling into 2022 and looking forward to the future whilst also looking back uh oh, for example really? mark perkins posted uh, a space 1999 comic strip uh, from an old magazine called look in uh, which you might remember which featured uh, comic strips from various tv programs from the bbc and primarily itv i think anyway he says, I just came across this from the pages of Lookin in April 1976 and thought I'd share it. It was a good few years since Mike Noble had injected new realism and excitement into Fireball XL5, Captain Scarlet and Zero X in the pages of TV21 in the 60s. Uh, I always felt he was wasted on strips like Folly Foot, and I can remember how excited I was when he was given Space 1999, but disappointed it wasn't in colour. I don't think it lasted long, but this one overflows with his magic touch. Ah. Yeah, and there's a lovely picture there. Aid Swatridge posted interesting piece on fab facts about uh, Shamuli last week. Oh, Shamuli, you remember is that? It? Yes. Aid Swatridge says, I used to work in their marketing team when it was Payne's Wessex Shamuli, and I have some great stories from when we used to do demos of line throwers, rockets, and flares. Let's just say health and safety in those days wasn't like it is today. <laughs> Fun days indeed. Great company, says Aid. Well, glad to hear you survived, uh, Aid. Uh, Steve Bushel says, I've just started reading Five Star Five, and it's turning out to be a cracking read. Yeah. Should be a movie, he says. Absolutely. Should have been. Should well, be. I mean, yeah, could still happen. <laughs> that's, uh, that's true. Yep, looking forward to the royalties. Uh, Steve Beresford says, Today's podcast with Toy Polloi brought back a memory playing Terror Hawks as a kid by using marbles and dice in place of zeroids and cubes. Bigger marbles were megazoids and a five on a dice made a nice cube blaster stand-in. Of course, yes. There's, oh, you see, there's often a, a joy, isn't there, to be had in adapting your present toys to be other toys from your favourite TV shows, even more so perhaps than buying uh, the toys from the TV show. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does, just I'm, about, yes. It does make sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and also much cheaper, of course. Uh, Keith Gooch says... Uh, 
bit late in putting up my Thunderbirds calendar, and I've just noticed the January pages and the so-called Around the World Explorer, Edworth Hart, is in fact Frank Lincoln, the lighthouse keeper, from the Stingray episode, The Lighthouse Dwellers. I don't want to bring up the Thunderbirds dating game again, but if we accept that only televised events are canon, then Thunderbirds is set in 2025 and Stingray in 2065, so the two shows can't be connected, so what is a Stingray character doing in a Thunderbirds calendar? Well, first of all, I think the more broadly accepted thing is 2065 for Thunderbirds, uh, <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about that. And also, yeah. they did redress the puppet characters between shows, so it would only be appropriate to do so even if it's done digitally. So yeah. I hope that is satisfying. Response. Yeah, and, and again, I know lots of people have been enjoying receiving their uh, calendars. I'm sure they're up on many walls around the world now, which is There's great. One in my kitchen at this moment, in fact. Perfect, perfect. Uh, now, finally, Tom Hodden's been busy over oh, Christmas. Oh, not Tom as you might Hodden, imagine. really? Well, he's compiling a few more uh, you-know-whats. So it's time for Tom Hodden's Quick Fire Five! Mm. <laughs> Right, this week, says Tom, some of our favourite characters are having to downsize. But, Jamie, which would you rather see? The Tracy Brothers in Albert Square or Officer Orin transferring to Doc Green? <laughs> Orin of Doc Green, for sure. <laughs> yeah, you like that? Uh, the Protectors in Port Merion or the Terrorhawks on Fang Rock? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ter- ter- Terrorhawks on Fang Rock, for sure. OK. Uh, Marineville replaced with Milton Keynes or Lady P in Crinkly Bottom? Oh, definitely Penny's Quickly Bottom. <laughs> uh, Captain Scarlet next door to Victor Meldrew, or Captain Black moves in with Joey and Chandler? Oh! <laughs> Scarlet and Meldrew, but only really? just. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. And finally, number five, Joe 90 in Grange Hill, or Father Unwin in the Crossroads Motel? Ooh. I'm going to give Joe a chance at Grange Hill. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Fantastic. There we are. Thank you once again, Tom Hodden, for another marvellous Quickfire 5. Thank you indeed, Tom. Now, you can see how I've, uh, I've outsourced the Quickfire 5s now, can't you? Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, who knows what you'll be outsourcing next? <laughs> uh, now, good old Tom, he's furnished me with, with, with plenty to keep me busy for the next uh, few weeks, so expect <laughs> many more oh, no. where they came from. OK, thanks, Tom. <laughs> thanks, Nicky. Uh, yeah. Look, before we go over to our uh, second part of the interview with Dave from Toy yeah. Boy, I've got two more reviews here for the uh, oh, Moonbase yes. Technical Manual. Uh, Paul N. from the UK says, probably the best piece of tie and merchandise I've ever bought. This oh, book wow. is amazingly detailed, imaginative, informative, and interesting. It's a must-have for any Space 1999 fan. The illustrations and accompanying text are fantastic. I highly recommend that you get a copy. You won't be disappointed. Well, wow, that's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and uh, one more here from Mark in the UK. Uh, he says, it's a work of art. The content and quality of this book is absolutely fantastic. A great update to my original 1970s technical notebook. As a lifelong fan of the show, I feel that nothing in the new book looked out of place. It's hard to believe that such a great piece of work has been produced over 40 years since the original show aired. Wow. Oh, yes. These are these lovely reviews. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it means so much, I think, to so many people, doesn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. so lovely to it, hear. It is lovely, but it, it also means that, you know, because it's it's quite an investment of quite an undertaking for the company and for the team so to know that yes. it's so well received means that we're more likely to do cool stuff like this in the future yeah, so uh, you right. know all the feedback and the reviews and uh, stuff really helps now yeah. uh, you don't want to hear any more of, uh, of me and Richard it's time for me and Dave isn't it um, <laughs> great so you, need, you need a rest after all of your heavy <laughs> heavy uh, outsourcing you've been doing uh, I have, that's you know true, yes. getting all the pods to write right things for you to read and yes, yes, Tom yes, Hodden right. writing quick fire yes, for all you right. Uh, right. and now you can rest on your laurels while I interview Dave now Dave Thanks. runs the YouTube channel Toy Beloy he uh, uh, re- refurbs restores fixes and uh, collects toys from across mm. the decades uh, and this is the second part where we chat all things Anderson how to collect how, get it, how to get into it why you collect um, what's so special and so powerful about collecting toys and all such gubbins so uh, here we go it's part two of Toy Beloy and Dave in terms of then the way they were made, do you think, because you've already mentioned Transformers, which I mm. very much in my head from my childhood, I think as a, as a 2D animation, essentially. So does it make any difference to you as a collector now or did then as a kid, seeing the, the models, the physical models being brought to life on an Anderson show and the desire to recreate that versus something like in 2D animation? Or is there no difference to you in appeal? For me, I don't think there was no, there was, 
no real difference. It's just that sort of being able to recreate something, you know, because you just use your imagination. Like, or, you know, like you know, certainly I, I found I probably was a, a very over imaginative child. I would recreate everything I possibly could. So it didn't matter. You know, Transformers was one thing. The toys, although look nothing like the cartoon, it doesn't matter. I still, it was just the uniqueness of them and, and just being able to play and recreate stuff in my mind. I would build lots of like, I, I'm going to call them dioramas, but dioramas is probably a grand way of, of describing something I made as a child, you know, getting boxes and stuff and making little, uh, you know, dens and HQs for things to hide in and, you know, as I said, using bits of Lego to, to build stuff. So, you just make stuff up you know so it doesn't matter if one thing's 2d one thing's you know real life or whatever you just mm. you know there's there was no problem with crossing over those sort of boundaries you are just a, a passionate toy collector <clears throat> certainly now yeah i don't as, as a child i wouldn't have said i was a, a toy collector i just a toy you know just playing with toys now yeah. i think it's it's certainly turned into a toy collector but i still insist to people i i'm just playing with toys just in a different way you know yeah it, it's there's no difference i may not be scrabbling about on the floor fighting toys together although sometimes i do let's face it <laughs> but um it, you know i am i am sitting at my desk taking toys apart trying to repair them trying to improve them or just do things uh, you know that i feel they missed out on back when they were making the toys so mm. you know it's still playing with toys i'm just a little bit older and my knees aren't quite up to kneeling on the floor the whole time and messing about. <laughs> I'm about to play on the desktop instead yeah yeah so j- just talk me then day through a few of the sort of um the best toys in your collection and they don't have to be anderson ones obviously you don't even have to mention a single anderson one but may- maybe just pick out sort of three or four or five highlight items that our listeners maybe might go oh yeah because they you know this the love of sci-fi extends far beyond Anderson. Yeah. Uh, so what, well, what's that? I think cer- certainly Action Man has become a big part of my collection in recent, recent mm. years. I used to have a lot as a kid and then sort of got rid of them and only got back into it about 10 years ago. But the uh, the Space Ranger Action Men, uh, which are, you know, the, the sort of the sci-fiest versions of action man you can get those have been, become an absolute sort of love of mine. And I've been trying to collect <laughs> all of all that I can. I just like the look of them. They are action man, but with, you know, sci-fi helmets and for some reason, very weird space uniforms that are made out of rubber. It's a, it's a weird combination, but I absolutely <laughs> love those. And I've been, I've been picking those up sort of endlessly. Yep. I do like Star Wars, all things Star Wars. I think the vehicles and some of the, the vehicle designs for those are mm. classic, like the eight, the ATAT from Empire Strike, yeah. the, the walking one. It's just there's nothing i don't love about the design of that and mm. the toy is is equally as good i've ended up i think i've got four of them now you know it's one of those ones <laughs> i've got one i love it so much i'll get another one yeah um, so those those are you know highlights certainly um but yeah my collection is quite varied i've got an awful lot of um japanese toys now um but i i go to japan sort of i try to go every year if i possibly can and pick yeah. up uh, Japanese toys. they make toys better than anyone else and in fact i have one uh japanese uh thunderbird 2 toy that i got recently and it is just it's so much better than the, the one you could get in the uk i don't know why but the japanese version is just a work of art it's yeah. so lovely is that the, Re- the rebel tech one or one of the others no i think it, these are made by a, again by a bandai popey p-o-p-y the people okay. who made the terror hawks vehicles ah. uh, but i think the Japanese market, they could make things a little bit daintier. So it's got like a flip up nose section with missiles in it and very dainty legs that, that swing down. The Japanese children obviously played a little bit uh, more gently with their toys. Mm. So they, they went to an extra level. With, but it's just a, a work of art, this thing. Um, so nicely made. Yeah, I de- definitely noticed a huge difference between Japanese and non-Japanese toys in terms of accuracy. It's, they seem to research stuff really finely and squeeze in more and more fine detail and little tiny components why yeah, I, why can't we do better i don't know i think that japanese there's certainly something about all japanese it, sort of japanese toys whenever i go there i see stuff and just think oh it's so beautifully made but mm. would if it had been released here it would have been destroyed instantly it's yeah. just there's no part of it that that wouldn't break that, you know i don't for a japanese market they're perfect for an english market or uk market absolutely no chance of them ever being released here so yeah it's just i think it's just the way 
different nation's children uh, play with toys. Certainly there's yeah. a different, you know, there's a, there's a, a delicacy to playing with it in the Japanese sort of uh, child. Yeah. A, a brutality, I think, to how, <laughs> how uh, we would play with them, you know, really play with them, throw things around. Gosh. Yes, that uh, Saxon blood over here has made us all into brutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about what about the toy that you have the most versions of, the most editions of, or the most copies of? I, I, that has to be uh, Star Wars sort of stormtroopers and Imperials. I've been I've been that was again as a child the the, the sort of the scene in the hangar bay in, in Return of the Jedi. There's a shot with the Emperor and Darth Vader walking, and it's just row upon row of yeah. stormtrooper and that. And as a child, I had one stormtrooper and it was like, oh, I just want to do this. I want to do. This. So now I think I'm up to about 250, maybe 260. <laughs> of, of and it was the, me thinking, yeah, maybe he's got as many as 50. That would be crazy. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, I've got, I've got, I can recreate that scene almost perfectly now. I've got so many sort of imperial figures. Just that scene, I don't know, is, is, it's just stuck in my mind as something I always wanted to do. And again, yeah. as I say, now I don't have any sort of uh, pocket money limits. And also I am a very patient collector. I've been, yeah. I've been picking up stormtroopers now for sort of 25 years. So every time I see one for under three pounds, I will buy it. And so my, <laughs> my army just sort of slowly grows. Amazing. Okay. Uh, that's definitely more than I was expecting of any one toy. So uh, <laughs> consider me blown away. What about any toys, Dave, that, you wish that had been made to coincide with some shows originally. Certainly, uh, well, as, as we mentioned, there's the, the Zelda cubes. I, I still think someone needs to make one of them. I've made a few over, over the last few, few, sort of few years yeah. to fit with the uh, the uh, Bandai figures. And I made a big one recently. I, uh, someone sent me an old clock that was, I'm going to say it's about sort of 10 centimetres square, but it just looks like a Zelda cube. So I took yeah. it apart took all the guts out of it and made a light up version. So the, the eyes light up in this one. I Very just cool. think someone, you know, this is dying out to be made. I would have that as a bedside light, you know, just, mm. I, I think those need to be made more. I even made some little dice versions. I found if you go on eBay, you can buy blank dice. They don't have any numbers on them. Mm. And you could buy little white ones with nice rounded corners and that. So I bought a bag of about 50 of these dice and carefully printed out <laughs> the faces for the Zelda cubes nice. and stuck them on, which it was a very tedious task. But I now have a pile of these cubes and you can build little walls and knock them down. I was, as a child, I would have loved that. I don't know why, yeah. but just the fact that you can build them up. I've even put magnets in a few of them now so you can stick them together and, and sort you of... Can do, build... You can do the gun one. Yeah, and that. yeah. because that again, that's a that's an iconic shot from the show. And it's like, I want to make that. So, yeah. you know, for me, it's always stuff like that. Anything that is an iconic shot in the show mm. will stick in my mind. And I think, you know, the Terror Hawks, all of the main vehicles were made. It was the baddies that we didn't have. You want yeah. Sci Star, and that you you want some of the other creatures and and things that they attack. I think that always it's the enemies. So like in Space Nineteen Ninety Nine, the uh, the Mego Palatoy dolls. They made five of them. Mm. You've got Commander Koenig, you've got Alan Carter, you've got Paul Murrow, and then you've got two aliens uh, that are sort of. I'm going to say almost nondescript. You've got, you know, the Captain Xantor with his long hair and the mysterious yeah. lady with his bald head. It's like, no, I want more. I want some some other creatures. I also want more members of Moonbase Alpha. Yeah. I, know, you know, I know they remade some a few years ago, they, the um, uh, CTV toys or whatever they were called, yeah. made some, but they weren't as good. It's the old ones I want, the old stuff. Yeah, they were made of stronger stuff and better designed maybe yeah. and just more, more, just more tactile. They did more, I guess. Yes, yeah. Okay. If there's any single vehicle or character, you can only have one, though, mm. from any Anderson show, and let's discount the cubes because you've already made the case oh, for the cubes. Yeah, I did the cubes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see where you go with that. Mm. Is there any one thing you could be? I mean, you can literally say, yeah, I want a 44-inch eagle that actually takes on flies around the room, whatever. That you, you know, What's your dream Anderson toy? Well, they actually made my dream Anderson toy, and I've never managed to get it, which is the Mattel version of the Eagle, which is oh, massive. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, it's a really big thing. It's it's probably a, you know a meter long or something. Yeah, they were huge, weren't they? Yeah, and that is, it's, I would class that as a proper Grail toy, one that I only seen I think one or two in the UK 
you know, mm. in my entire time of collecting, they've always been out of my price range by a few hundred pounds. I would absolutely love one of those. I think they, you know, so they did make the toy I wanted. It's just, I've never managed to get one. Oh, and I bet a few of our listeners had them as kids and probably don't have them anymore because it's a constant story I hear of, oh, I had that, but my mum threw them out or I got rid of it when I moved house. I mean, yeah. did, did you loot, did you get rid of your entire collection at some point? Yep. I sold everything I had I had when I was about 15 or 16. So I got into computers and remote control cars and the I managed, I think I saved about five figures uh, from the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons line. I don't, it was a, a, a toy I really liked. I kept a couple of Star Wars figures and I, I kept most of my Transformers. Everything else went. And, you know, when I reached my 20s, it was like, oh, what did I do? You know, at the time you don't think about it, but it's like, mm. oh, I wish I hadn't done that. And I think that's might have been my entire collecting time as getting all of those toys back, all of the toys. I never had that I wanted as well and other things that just grabbed my eye. And I'm still picking up toys that I remember having. And, mm. you know, suddenly something will just click in my mind. It'd be like, oh, I remember that. And, and I'll, I'll go down a sort of rabbit hole of trying to track this toy down. And they're not always things that other people even remember or, or that are worth anything. It's, yeah. it's There's no value sometimes in, in a toy that I find. It's just that need, that memory that it brings back. Yeah. The value comes from nostalgia rather than from the the market value as such. Oh, certainly. I think that's that goes for any collection. There are, you know, there are toys that are worth a lot of money, but then there are toys that are priceless because mm. of your memory that you have of playing with them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think of my Daypole TARDIS console, for example, which I've held on to since whenever I got it in 1990 or something. And I, you know, it is the one and I would never part with it. So I yeah totally totally get that yeah Um, it's just it's that you have this link and i think that that toy links you to a certain time in your life and it's that that is the important thing or just a memory of a of a a family member you know my dad passed away a couple of years ago but i have some toys that that aren't my original toys but they they remind me of times with my dad picking them up so it's like it's it's that sort of link uh, that you get via this tiny, you know, bit of plastic or a bit of metal or whatever it is, it will link you back to yeah. a specific time. Yeah, it's quite a powerful thing. I, I actually, I don't know what I've done with it, but I picked up one of those 1990s Terminator toys with a little rubber waist points oh, yeah, where it yeah. turns it. But I just, but I, the minute I managed to get hold of it again, the smell, the weight, the texture of it, the temperature. It's amazing how those those really really sort of tangible uh, memories those those memories of feeling yeah. can be so powerful. Yes, it's, it's, it is the smell. Sometimes there are toys that still smell exactly as I remember <laughs> them, and you think like, how has that smell lasted for for all these years? It's just something about that you know that smell will take you right back to however young you were and playing with it. It's like, oh that it's just amazing i think that's what the, the dinky eagle does to me it's the weight of it you yeah. pick it up and it's like oh yeah i remember that it's you yeah. know there's nothing you don't even have to do anything with it it's just picking it up and going oh yeah yeah and probably none of those qualities are the qualities that they were thinking about when they were manufacturing i mean 100 and, 180 something podcasts ago we had lee sullivan the comic artist on and he was talking endlessly about sniffing his um his budgie supercar right right so <clears throat> it's exactly the same yeah just the, the strangest things that keep us connected yeah. uh, Dave, if if somebody is looking to reignite their passion for toys and collecting where are some good places to, for them to start i mean i guess they're going to be looking at ebay pretty much straight away so i you know i would actually start on youtube and watch some people reviewing and playing with toys i know a, lo- a lot of people watch my channel and go I know I don't remember that, but as soon as I saw it, I had to go and find one. You know? <laughs> so I would watch people on YouTube and see. Certainly, there were some people who have a real enthusiasm for, you know, this these memories and stuff, which is essentially what my channel is. It's you know a lot of memories of, of childhood and fixing things, because you're if you see someone who's enthusiastic about it and and you know excited by these things, still it it will ignite your passion in mm. in them. And you know, if there are there are so many toys out there to collect. You don't have to collect what everyone else collects. And certainly that that's, you know, I don't do that. And you'll find odd things will, will get you excited. You'll suddenly go, oh, what's that odd thing? 
it's it's weird so yeah watch youtube videos ebay is one of those things you can go down at ebay and end up spending huge amounts of money and, and sort of feel a little bit dissatisfied when these mm. turn up so check out some other people's collections and see what they're excited about and see what you know something may spark a memory and that will start you off and then you can then go and find it go to toy fairs i go to a lot of uh, sort of vintage toy fairs mm. and flea markets and stuff and you just walk around a flea market not even particularly looking for anything and you'll see there'll be some item on a table some old toy that you've long forgotten be like oh my god like i don't remember that or you know i, I remember playing with that and I've, I've now got to have it sort of thing so do that just wander around flea markets are fantastic for for igniting your memory of of these things and toy fairs are the same i go to toy fairs yeah. you know every every sort of month and even now i still see sort of see things that you know have a vague recollection of it's like oh god you know completely forgotten about it amazing okay well that's that's a great tip rather than going straight to ebay and if somebody's looking to restore repair change up toys have you got any sort of general advice other than going to your youtube channel of course uh, well, that's the, the first place to start always because i i've fixed up quite a lot of stuff you know over the years generally though i just say go for it if, if it's a toy that is broken which you know that generally that's what i do the worst you can do to it is is break it some more but it doesn't matter if it's already broken <laughs> it, it literally makes no difference you'll yeah. you will have fun doing it and if the end result is not quite what you wanted you will have had fun playing with it and learning about it and you know the next one you try to fix you'll get better at it i was you know when i've i've been sort of repairing toys most of my life now but the first ones i fixed were probably pretty terrible but now you know i sort of learned the right the, the sort of the ways of doing stuff but all the time i'm having fun doing it and i, I never sort of regret fixing anything or, me mm. or messing about with anything toys they're there to be played with i know people as we sort of discussed put a value on them but the yeah. value is actually your enjoyment out of them that is far more important than 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 anything i've had plenty of people say what i do is sacrilege sometimes you know fixing up a, a toy i think no i've i've found a toy that cost me a few pounds and i've spent hours fixing it and i've had hours of enjoyment out of it so mm. that few pounds was well spent if other people don't like my, the end result of it doesn't matter i've had it's yours it's mine i've put my mark on it i'm just playing with it and having fun nice i think that potentially has the the, the possibility of opening up a new dimension of enjoyment actually in people's collections because often they are a bit scared of doing stuff they don't want to have a go and i and i get that you know i've had a few things in the past where there's a little paint chip or whatever and i'm just i, I feel like oh if i if i fix it and it's wrong then it's going to look rubbish but actually it's it your own matter. choice anyway I, I've, I've sort of discussed on my channel a few times is what i call toy entropy which is basically nothing lasts forever all of these toys that we bought in, and play with they were designed to last you know six months to a year and be played mm. with and then be thrown away so the fact that some of these toys 50 odd years later are still here is a, is a miracle they're all degrading in their own way especially the plastic stuff plastic doesn't last forever so enjoy it while it's here because you know 20 years more down the line it's just going to be mush it's going to have fallen apart or dis disintegrate so enjoy it for what it is and don't you know don't worry about the damaging these things they just play with them that's what they're for you know get some enjoyment out of all of them i think that's a, a great message to leave people with uh dave if people want to find you online and watch some of your fantastic videos and hopefully make some cubes uh from terror hawks uh, how how can they find you where can they find you uh well i i'm on all social media but my main point of sort of interest for everyone go to youtube search for toy polloi i will come up I, i'm the sort of I think I'm probably one of the biggest uh, toy restoration channels there is, certainly UK based. I've got, uh, I'm, I'm reaching almost 50,000 subscribers now. So nice. there's a lot of people out there who know about me and know about fixing toys. So head there and you'll find videos on all sorts of toy lines from Terra Hawks, Space 1999, Action Man, Star Wars, Transformers. I mean, I think I've covered most sort of toy lines of my youth at, at least by now and more i'm still every week i'm putting up new videos and new you know more toys are being fixed each week brilliant and maybe just people watching that you're going to create a new generation a new group of toy surgeons and toy restorers toy I mechanics hope so. i hope so i know a lot of people sort of my age you know i'm i'm nearing 50 but a lot of people are are sitting there with their children watching my videos and i think that 
the it's good to get a young generation of people and kids learning how to fix toys and also to be excited by toys and not worry if you break something it's not the end of it you can do something else with it you can make it something better or you just take it down your own route and i think it's great that it's not just middle-aged men watching my videos it's there's a new generation coming along who are enjoying and seeing the potential of fixing repairing and just enjoying toys amazing i, I feel inspired to now try and repair my very sad looking day paul dalek um which has seen better days so I'm, i might go look at that have you done any restorations of those dave uh, do you know what? I haven't? No, uh, I've, I've, there's a, a lot of people ask me for Doctor Who restoration, so it could be something I do. I have an old uh, Mego Tom Baker, or the Palatoy Tom Baker, in a box, oh, yes. but he is missing most of his clothes, and I think he's also missing a foot. So at some point, <laughs> he will get uh, repaired, but I need to find more of him before I can start that project. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I had I had one of those. So uh, uh, sadly, no more. So I look forward to that. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for for joining us and uh, go and search for Toy Ploy on YouTube. Thanks a lot. Thanks Dave. for having me. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Ah, oh, lovely, Dave. Thank you so much. I know a lot of people have said they found your uh, last week's very, very nostalgic yeah. uh, and has made them revisit their own toy collections or even look into collecting. So uh, great job, Dave. Now, if you'd like to follow Toy Polloi, you can find Toy Polloi across the internet, uh, youtube.com slash Toy Polloi. That's T-O-Y-P-O-L-L-O-I. Uh, Twitter is at Toy underscore Polloi. Facebook, mm. facebook.com slash Toy Polloi. Instagram at Toy Polloi, and even on their own website at toypolloi.com. <sighs> That's great. Anyway, almost uh, y- yes, uh, fifty thousand subscribers on YouTube. I see. I know they're they're not far behind us. That's, that's <laughs> no. great, isn't it? Well done, yes. Uh, they doing Dave. Well. well done, them. Yeah, but it is lovely stuff that Dave does, and it yeah. is extremely nostalgic. So uh, keep up the good work, Dave. Now, before we move along, I have mm. another review, another five oh, yeah. star review. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this one is from Kenneth D in the US. Kenneth says, in a word, the Space 1999 Technical Operations Manual is exceptional. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. After waiting 46 years for a comprehensive technical manual, this fantastic show, I can certainly say it's worth the wait. Excellent colour pictures, well thought out drawings, rare photos and believable backstories. This book is head and shoulders above the original three ring binder manual, which wasn't bad itself. I will be absorbing a considerable amount of information from it in the near future. Uh, Now, if you could just get that tentacled monster out of my nightmares. Uh, Yeah, sorry, (laughs) Kenneth. We can't do anything about Dragon's Domain. But uh, thank you kindly for your review another five star review it's amazing well yeah isn't it jamie now talking of five star reviews yes uh the podcast of course is available in a variety of places you know spotify apple podcasts youtube uh, but also <laughs> did you know it's available on audible.co.uk is it it is How now is and uh, well there you go ken p norton has given us a five star rating and a review saying another excellent episode i've been listening since pod one Imagine wow. that, uh, as I'm a huge fan of Jerry Anderson's body of work, both Super Marination and live action. Hosts Jamie Anderson, son of the late great Jerry, and Richard James guide us through the Andiverse, both old and new. There's Fab Facts, the Jerry Anderson News, and Celeb Interviews. This week, it's the second part of Beth Chalmers' interview, where she talks about her involvement in the Terror Hawks audios from Big Finish and Anderson Entertainment, amongst other things. Then, helping to wrap things up, we have Chris Dale's Randomizer, in which Chris takes a randomly chosen episode from the Randomizer and comments on it usually with hilarious results full marks from me roll on next monday says ken for the next episode Uh, isn't that nice that's great i didn't even know we were on audible so i know yeah we're everywhere can't get rid of us if you're listening on audible uh, Podstron, then welcome along. That's very nice yes. to have you here. Uh, and right. add, adds to the plethora of places you can get it, like uh, all those weirdly emphasised names <laughs> that Richard previously read. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I like to keep you on your toes. I feel very kept on my toes. Now, yes. it's time, I think, for... Yes. I'm trying to consider how we should say this. Well, probably on. one of the most crucial uh, parts of the, the podcast, which 
perhaps could be said to be head and shoulders above the oh. rest. But of course, ah. in Chris's current position, yes. his head and shoulders are below the rest. Below the rest, so yes. While well, Chris noticed. writes himself uh, yes. and uh, stops doing handstands over there in the corner, uh, it's time for the randomizer where Chris randomly chooses a random episode from the randomizer, as in fact Ken P. Norton has just described as read by Richard <laughs> yeah. James. Uh, exactly. Um, I mean, he's, yeah. he's got it quite succinctly, I yeah, thought. I think he, he probably it. said it better than I'd say it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right, well then, uh, here's the randomizer. Meister Chris Dale with the randomizer. Uh, let's see what he's got in store for us. Oh, oh dear. Oh, oh, waking up in another prison cell, am I? Well, that's certainly a fun way to kick off 2022. Oh, hello there. Uh, and you would be. I am Malik. Ah. Seems you must die. Oh. And we have yet to become acquainted. Sad, isn't it? Oh yes, yes, terribly sad, and yet, considering how the last two years have gone, also not terribly distressing, I have to say. You're free, alien. Ah, well, thank you, that's... suspicious. You do not trust me. Uh, not particularly, no. Uh. No, not with a name like Malik. I do like an honest answer. In fact, I suspect that you're angling for a go on the randomizer. Would that be correct? It is my wish to serve you. Ah, well, in that case, yes, please have at it. Whatever you ask. Whatever would you do without me, alien? Oh, I shudder to think. Why are you looking at my brainstem like that? Ah. All over. That's right, and if you'd care to pass me the printout... Ah, well, today's episode is from Fireball XL5. And you approve. Oh yes, I certainly do approve, as it's one I've always had a bit of a soft spot for. Here's the Robot Freighter Mystery. Go. Yeah, all right, I'm... I'm... Go! Before I change my mind. All right, I'm going, I'm going. Such a difficult man to serve. So, welcome back to Fireball XL5 on the Randomizer. Welcome indeed to the very first Randomizer of 2022. And I know you're saying, oh no, we had one last week. This is the first episode I am recording in 2022, because you know nothing of my recording schedule. And uh, this is, um, oh, we're starting out on a robot freighter. And here is the master robot console. Everything looks okay. I'm not an expert in master robot consoles, but, uh, oh, the ship has stopped. <gasps> and the master robot console seems to be on fire. It's not good. And it went kablooey. Uh oh, oh, that's interesting. What in thunder is that, Commander Zero? It's the robot supply freighter alarm. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's the first. It's the first randomizer of the year. No. Oh, so that ringing alarm bell. We sabotage your robot supply. Freighter. Is marked robot freighter alarm. Cargo. Yeah, yeah, and space. That's the sole reason for that alarm's existence. And Steve is. What is it? What is it? I could read the words that it says there, but. Uh, sure. Sabotage. Oh, I, I, I've forgotten how to read, Commander Zero. Oh dear, I wasn't prepared for a. Uh, such a glorious bit of stupidity, uh, so soon out of the gate. Salvage company, cargo ship back. Ah, anyway, we have, uh... Come in, Commander. These chaps, the Briggs brothers... We're about to do a deal again. ...on their space salvage ship. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell me I know. You're approaching our robot supply freighter. You've hit it right on the nose, Commander. And I've got to say... salvage your gear long before... This episode is, um... Okay. I don't know if it, it would take first place, it might take second, but it is certainly a strong contender for ugliest guest puppets in any Super Mario Nation series. These two brothers, and one more character that we're going to see shortly, are quite hideous. I would say that it, the first place is taken by... Um, uh, it's a supercar episode, I think, The Sky's the Limit, where there's one, two gangsters, one of whom looks like he's... he's gone through a windshield, and the other one who looks like Pinocchio. Anyway. Okay, Joe. You taking your oxygen pill? Uh, you bet, Slim. 
I sure wish you'd asked me that before you opened the door in the space, Slim. It might have been dangerous if I'd said no. Yeah, the B Briggs brothers are... Well, they're going across to the, uh, the freighter that has been disabled. Although it was interesting that in the shot of them leaving their airlock, you could see the other ship ahead of them, courtesy of um, back projection or whatever. But it was the model was clearly their own ship. Um, there was a bit of a goof there because their ship is marked as a space salvage ship. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm getting to know the layout of these robot freighters like the back of my hand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you ought to them. This is the third ship we've uh, <laughs> uh, salvaged in the past couple of months. These guys are the baddies, in case you didn't know. And my goodness, they are hideous. Right, Joe. Joe, I think, just about gets away with it because he's his voice kind of matches the get the cargo out. the look of the character. I don't want no space patrol boys finding out how the freighter was sabotaged. He 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 sounds kind of dumb and he looks kind of dumb. But the other one, get clear, slim. That is, I think, a problem with the face. The face is too thin, which makes the eyes look too big. Oh, aboard the freighter is uh. There must be a million bucks worth here in salvage, though. Yeah, including uh, Professor Matic's uh, Plyton detector from the Granitoid tanks. Luxury for the rest of our lives. Wow. You set that bomb yet, Joe? We've got to get these lead cases out of here. Hey, I'm coming, Slim. It's a uh, cinch moving this cargo with no gravity. Well, you need your jetpacks as well. Yes, these chaps are raiding freighters. This stuff's as light as a feather. Stealing stuff and explaining to themselves what they are doing as they go. Very handy. And um, yeah, I was very happy to see this episode come up today because this episode was... I I've gone on before about my history of Fireball XL5 on VHS. Had the UK Fireball XL5 VHS releases continued, this was would have been the next episode to have been released on VHS. So... When I finally got to see this episode on the uh, tape trading network in the the early 2000s, it was it was uh, from someone's off-air recording from I think Central Television. Going up soon, shouldn't it? It did feel like a really yeah. special moment. This was something I wasn't supposed to be seeing. This was something I thought I would never see. We're out of the blast area. And there she blows. Ooh, there we go. One less freighter in the universe. Oh, lots of debris though. And uh, yeah, 20 years after that uh, grotty old VHS tape, here we have Fireball XL5 in HD on Blu-ray. Touching down soon. This is my first um, viewing of this episode in HD, so... Uh, is it from the Briggs Brothers? We all it's it's, an, it's an, a nostalgic episode for me that I'm, I'm not sure if, if this is a particular favourite of people or, or not. Have proof before we can do that. Just knowing isn't enough. Say, that's the Valiant coming in now, isn't it, Commander? I guess so, Steve. I don't know. What do you think I am, controller of some kind of space city that keeps tabs on this sort of thing? We have your salvaged equipment, Commander. Yeah, yeah, I know. Get your ship down here. You're all clear to land. Oh, so this is a nice scam these guys have got going. Blowing up the freighters and then selling the salvage back to Space City. But yeah, going back to what I was saying about favourite episodes, it's strange because with, with shows like Thunderbirds, you know... Episodes like Trapped in the Sky and, and Terror in New York City are the classics and everybody loves them. And then there's episodes like Give or Take a Million and, uh, I don't know, uh, Moving Your Dead, where some people aren't too fond of them. One at the Pentagon and you'll get your money. But there are shows like XL5 where I'm not really in tune with the sort of fan consensus of what the best episodes of this show actually are. Just don't push your luck too far, that's all. I can only go by what what I enjoy the most, what brings me the most, uh, most viewing pleasure, and, uh... Out before I arrest you for trespassing! This is an episode I've always enjoyed. Long, gentlemen! We'll be seeing you soon. I think it's because of the, uh, the audacious nature of the villains running this scam. Next move, Commander. Uh, basically in the World Space Patrol's face. They know exactly what's going on, but they just can't prove it. Jack. That freighter you're getting ready. And it's partly because of the fact that they're so deeply stupid. Meanwhile... Robot Supply Freighter 8. I want it checked and double-checked. Is that clear? Okay, Commander. Leave it to me. Here's Jock and... Edmundo. Edmundo. I want you to listen carefully to me. I am all the ears, as they say, Jock. 
Jock has, for one week only, his own personal report. Anything you see out uh, of Manuel, essentially. I shall check after you. What? Uh, what is this you are saying? Okay. Are you not trusting me? Does my work not please Jock? You're not trusty guy who only showed up this week and looks very suspicious. Oh. Yes, he uh, he does look a bit suspicious. Dancy job, Jock. All checks read green. Again, I don't know if it's the suspicious voice, or the huge bulging eyes, or the uh, Commander Zero Dewey. The uh, well, quite staggeringly impressive monobrow. But uh, I've got him pegged as a villain. It's robot computer. Again, it's that thing of. Here's a character that we've never seen before, who's clearly in a position of authority. Some sabotage is going on. Gee, I wonder who who it could be. And I think the live-action shows got away with that kind of thing sometimes, because those shows kind of had a, a, a large cast and a large cast turnover, so you wouldn't necessarily assume that this guy you've never seen before wasn't just a brand new character. In the Super Mario Nation shows, when they parachute a new character in like this... You kind of immediately know all checks read green that uh, they're up to no good. No, I'm a way to my bed. Especially when they're paired up with someone so reliable like Jock. Oh, we're in Jock's bedroom. Oh, oh he even gets Scottish sleeping music and a framed painting of a Scotsman in Steve Zodiac's bedroom. He has model of XL5, of course. Whose other bedrooms are we going to see? No, no one, but we are seeing a shadowy figure making their way out to the next robot freighter. This is freighter number eight. I wonder who this could be. Well, we didn't see Venus's bedroom, did we? So, uh, do we think it might be Venus? Might she have turned traitor? <laughs> oh! The supply ship will never reach its destination. You'll never believe this. Mundo is not so stupid as they all think. Edmundo is the, the saboteur in Space City. Faithful, old, reliable Edmundo, whom we all know and love and trust, is in with the villains. And now we get this fairly lovely sequence, quite long though of Edmundo flying his car out to an island, presumably quite near Space City, to meet up with the Briggs Brothers to the, uh, the Crossroads to Crime soundtrack. Yeah, it didn't only appear in, in that one scene in, in Captain Scarlet in Manhunt, because it was also in this, and uh, I think they reused the score quite extensively in the supercar episode The White Line. But here we go, he's at the Space Salvage Company well, I hesitate to say headquarters. It's more of a shack, really. And inside... Hi, Ed. Come on in. Oh, dear. Try a hand, Joe. Okay. They're playing poker. They've both got cigars on the go, which makes having their... It means they've got their lips open, and I, I can kind of see the light coming in through the mouth. I can see light peeking in through the back of the puppet's skull. That's quite unsettling. Uh, I guess that does it. We'll have to call the whole thing off. Not on your life. Give me three cards, Joe. I'm not gonna give up our amazing lifestyle of sitting in a shack in the middle of nowhere for nobody. Jack, you're sure you ran a real thorough check on that supply freighter? I Commander Zero. I was the last... Oh, my goodness. Oh. Checks red green. They're trying to do a, a bit of an arty shot there of Edmundo listening to Jock, but it looks... He's so close to the camera, and he's, he's in so much darkness that it looks like he's turning into a werewolf. They've just got light on his eye. That was a that was an interesting attempt at uh, ready to lift off as soon as the supply ship is airborne. At something there. Here we go. Robot freighter number eight is away, and I do like the the design of of these robot freighters. I have a feeling this is probably just a a redress of a previous spacecraft, but I really like the look of these ships, and I. Uh, Honestly, I wouldn't say no to a little toy or a model of one, really. Oh, there's the ticking. Edmundo has planted his bomb in the Master Robot console. Freighter number eight. All clear for liftoff. Roger, Commander. But good old XL5 is going to escort it 
on its next run, make sure it doesn't run into any more problems. Well, so far so good. I wonder where our crooked salvage boys are waiting. Somewhere along the route, I guess. Maybe you should have monitored their, uh, the launch of their spaceship and see where it went. They'd have to be quite close to Space City if, if Edmundo can uh, get there by hovercar. Big Steve Zodiac. Yeah. Uh, but are you sure he'll be fooled by that tape recorder? Oh. This is clever. Emergency red. Emergency red. We are on fire. Request aid at once. Zodiac. They have a, a tape recording of a phony distress call. Recorded by a man who sounded really bored. For the position the recorder gives out. And then he's off our backs. Now all we have to do is push it out into space, where it will start transmitting just for Colonel Zodiac. Ah, well, isn't that thoughtful? And they've done it. The uh, radio thingy is off. And so are the Briggs brothers. Emergency red. Emergency red. We are on fire. We are on fire. Request emergency rescue. That's not that's not how you how you say those words. It, there should be more more screaming than that. Got it. Uh, it seems to be in our sector. Uh, position uh, twenty four zero one. And we're the nearest ship. We'll have to check it. Oh, they're the only ship in range. And they see they were doing that before Star Trek did it. Again. The supply freighter, Commander Zero. Okay. Lovely to see that even before Star Trek started using those tropes, XL5 had already worn them into the ground. But of course, I have known something like this had happened. They've had to leave the freighter. Commander Zero is is not happy. If only he he'd had it. If only he had more ships. Again, if only he was in charge of something like a a world space patrol almost that had ships that could go out and investigate these things. Don't understand it, Steve. This is the position that was given. But there's no sign of a ship. Well, hold on, Matt. I can see an object ahead. Ooh. Emergency red. Emergency red. Check on it, will you? I've got it, Steve. See? That's mighty odd. It's a tape recorder. Uh-huh. Put it together. I'd have known. Uh -huh. Folks, a dirty trick. And I don't need three guesses to tell me who planted that thing there. I guess the Briggs boys have done... <laughs> well, it. you might do. You might do, considering you looked at a bell, a, a bell earlier that was marked robot freighter alarm and said, what's that? There's such a tootie falling for a thing like that. A phony distress call. Well, that's one of the corniest tricks in the business. I'll never answer a distress call again. You mark my words. No, it could have been for real. That's right, Steve. We're dealing with a mighty smart bunch of characters. But don't... <laughs> <laughs> no, just because they're smarter than you doesn't mean they're genuinely smart. If it's the last thing I do, I'll nail those characters. Oh. And I think I know how to do it. <gasps> Steve's got a plan. So you think you know how to do it, eh, Steve? Well, let's hear it. Uh, no, Commander, I've already forgotten my plan. That was the previous scene. Another robot freighter. And have Jock do his double check again. Just like last time, when I screwed up. Monotonous. The freighter checks all read green again. So did freighter number eight get blown up and salvaged off screen then? I just being worked. We're just going to assume that one was lost. I, I, okay. Ah, so here comes Edmundo later on. After Jock's checked everything. Again, you wouldn't expect this of Edmundo. He's so... He looks so trustworthy. And yet, he's really let us down. Oh, he is quite unsettling to look at. Some interesting uh, computery sounding music there. I don't recognise that one as... Uh, as having recurred through the series, but Steve was already there. As I figured. Edmundo. Oh, of course. So, back to Briggs Space Salvage Island. Oh yes, they have their ship there, the SCS Valiant. They're still in there playing cards and smoking cigars. This is lovely music, though. I'd, I'd really like the Crossroads to Crime um, music to get a, a release. It really deserves it. It's easily the best part of that film. Though has done his stuff on the next freighter. Ooh. Hey, what the... Okay, get your hats, boys. You're going for a little trip. Ooh. Oh, this is Robot Freighter number nine, is it? That's just fine. Three rats in a trap, huh? Release us. 
You can't get away with this, Zodiac. We Steve has imprisoned everybody on this robot freighter. This is illegal. Handcuffed each of the Briggs brothers to uh, the wall. Well, quit squawking and listen to me. And they, it looks like he's put Edmundo in a cage. Best to sabotaging freighters of the World Space Patrol. And that little box of tricks there is going to help me do it. In there, my friends, is the bomb that you planted. <gasps> and it's set to go off three hours after liftoff. The oh, only dear. thing that can stop it is a radio-controlled switch that we've rigged up. And I'm going to operate it from Space City. If I hear you confess, I'll throw that switch. And the bomb won't explode. So it's up to you. You... Confession under duress, is it? Well, well, well. Nothing. Now stick around, boys, and find out. Three hours after liftoff. So, yeah, we're going ahead with the launch anyway. Oh, it's a nice model. It really is a pretty model. And I like that it's got vertical and horizontal uh, jets going as well. So the Briggs brothers and Edmundo are all in quite a lot of trouble. I do not like this. Mr. Fault, I no want to work here anymore. Ah, uh, shut up. Yeah, shut up. Zodiac's bluffing. He's got nothing on us. No, no. I wish you'd call this off, Steve. We'll find some other way to get them. No, Commander. They're clever. They cover their tracks all the way. Yeah, and you're going to run out of robot freighters by the time you come up with another plan. They're already cracking up. <laughs> Look, the clock. It says only ten minutes left. <gasps> uh -oh. Why don't you pipe down? Do you have to give us a time check every few seconds? I told you, didn't I? Zodiac was bluffing. Yeah, but supposing he ate. Oh, was Matt's mouth moving there as he was listening to that? They're not gonna break, Steve. They think you're bluffing. Now shut the thing off. Oh, we still got time, Commander. There's eight minutes left. I do like this, uh, this plan, though. I like the build-up as well. I like that we don't know whether or not Steve's bluffing. I tell you, they'll crack. It also helps that Commander Zero and Venus and Matt, they, they really believe it's for real, and they think he's not bluffing. She's gotta be bluffing. He wouldn't blow us up. No. He ain't that kind of guy. He's not like us. Steve, kill that thing. The suspense is driving me crazy. Two minutes to go, Commander. Oh, uh, I do not like it. Slim, Slim, please. I can't stand it much longer. But Zodiac's bluffing, I tell ya. And despite the fact that they're hideous puppets, I really do like all three of these villains. Um, I like that we have a, a traitor in Space City and these... Two idiots. Come on. Confess. Confess. Confess! 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 I confess! Not you! Oh, it's so tense. He, he is not bluffing. Coming up on 30 seconds to, uh... You shut it off, Zodiac. To the explosion. We sabotage the freighters. We are the ones. Shut it off! He's from Barcelona. <laughs> you won, Steve. You were right. Now kill the bomb. I can't, Commander. Oh, what do you mean you can't? Steve's right. So Edmundo's confession that he did the thing that Steve already knew he'd done. That gadget will operate at 12 noon anyway. I'm not sure that's going to stand up in court. I think a confession from the Briggs Brothers might have done a bit more there, but... Uh... Oh. Here we go. Oh, there's no stopping it now. Twelve. Ah. It's a ballerina musical box. I love that as well. I love... <laughs> it's it's quite a, a good piece of humour, especially for XL5. I told you so, didn't I, Joe? Of course, it does give you the image of... Told uh, us. Oh yeah, Commander Zero, I've got a plan. Now, first of all, I need to buy a musical box, preferably one with a ballerina. I meant this, you... you... Oh, if I could only get my hands free, I'd punch you straight in the nose. Yeah. 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 Well, at least I got a nose. Listen to the music. Oh, and I think Edmundo has gone completely insane. He's... he's just entranced by the, uh... Oh, the pretty music box and the ballerina. Ah, and that was Robot Freighter Mystery. Well, um, that was as thoroughly enjoyable as I remembered it. Again, some some very silly moments from our regular characters, but, you know, it's XL5. You're going to get that. 
but I I do really love the setup for this. I love the 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 robot freighters. I always like it in this show when you get a sense of space travel beyond just XL5 and and the Earth. I, I like when you see that there's a almost a whole universe full of Earth ships going here and there and doing whatever. So that's nice. I really like the uh, the Briggs Brothers characters and their little scam. I also like Edmundo and his uh, his traitorness. Uh, again, as I said, they're they're pretty hideous puppets, but that kind of uh, adds to the appeal of the characters in my eyes. So, yeah, as I said, I've always really liked this one. I don't know if it is just a nostalgia thing or if it is genuinely quite good. Um, but yeah, if you have any sort of feelings on fan favorite XL5 episodes, please let me know because, as I said, I'm not uh, not too up on those. But I do know that I thoroughly enjoyed this one. Lovely. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I, I knew it. <sighs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Yeah, I know. I I love good. my my uh, little Robert voice machine. It's very cool. Do you keep it just you know like right there? Because oh, it's, it's always to hand. Isn't it's, it? it's always within arm's reach. Yeah. Because um, you never know when you might need it. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, no. Fine. Do you use it on, you know, kind of conference calls and important meeting <laughs> Zooms and, or not? I don't is it I, just the podcast? It's, it's really just the podcast and Fireball-related okay. uh, material. Yes, yes, quite. But yeah. perhaps Good. I could... Uh, can you hear that knocking? What is that? Um, I think it's the cat having a scratch and <laughs> knocking oh, its foot against the wall. No, I was just going to say, <laughs> perhaps I could do an answer phone message or something. Uh, yes, yes, you must. Um, Absolutely. Jamie Anderson is not available. Please leave a message. <laughs> yeah, I think that'll work. Go for it. Right, I'll put it on straight away. Anyway, Chris, <laughs> thank you. Lovely Fireball XL5. Lovely bit of yes. a sing song there. It's Great. impossible not to. Uh, Chris will be back next week, uh, possibly even doing a one handed handstand, I guess. Well, he uh, might. He's getting very good at the two handed one. He wasn't using yeah. the wall last minute. Uh, no, I know. But he'll be back with another random episode next week. Uh, now, uh, just before we go, I do have some more uh, input from our lovely podstrons. This oh, time via Twitter, yeah, where people have been tagging me, Richard and James, him, I'm Jamie Anderson, and him over there just, uh, oh, got shaking the blood from his head, uh, Chris <laughs> Dalek, and they've been hashtagging us, Jerry Anderson Podcast, Lost in Transition says, just catching up with pod 184 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast, and about to listen to pod 185, Beth Chalmers sounds delightful, but the highlight of the pod was, and will be again, Chris Dale discussing Doppelganger, uh, a.k.a journey to the far side of the sun you absolute legend chris yeah he is that uh rod henderson said i got uh, jerry anderson space precinct for christmas such wonderful nostalgia love it the details and world be building is superb uh, and nice to see richard james in full flow Oh, good, isn't it? Uh, Chris Dale himself said, uh, Great to hear Beth Chalmers' memories of recording Terrorhawks in the latest Jerry Anderson podcast. As fab as it was to have the original cast back in action again, it was also fab to watch Beth fit into the mix like she'd always been there and add so much to the show. Well, so yeah. say it was. Bless Beth. Stuff. Here's an interesting one for you, Jamie. Jeff Owen tweeted, Hi, Jamie and Richard. This month's issue... Uh, of Fortean Times mentions this little board game gem from 1970. Do you know anything about this at all? And he attached uh, an image uh, of a little bit of text saying in 1970, Century 21 Merchandising Limited released UFO Red Alert, based on the Jerry Anderson series UFO. Players shoot down flying saucers before they reach Earth. The hit video game Space Invaders would reach arcades just eight years later with the same premise. The trifold board game and pieces came in a soft plastic black folder designed to look like it held top secret flight plans Mm. the game was available via a a mail away offer uh, with tokens as payment do you know anything about that ufo red alert i i don't no Uh, it sounds in fact i've just found a picture of the the game board which looks quite cool I bet. I th- I think we should try and do something with this, you know. Aha! Uh-huh. Looks great. pretty cool. Thanks to Jeff Owen for yeah, bringing that to our thanks, attention. Thanks, Jeff. I- I'll have a look at that as well. Yeah, marvellous. Uh, all for now, but uh, do uh, remember you can tweet us at any time. Hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast, uh, and we'll see your tweets. We will indeed. Now, can I leave you with a final review about the uh, Space 1999 book? I think you should. This is from Andrew P in the UK. Now, Andrew says, five stars, excellent value. I recently purchased the Moonbase Alpha Technical Manual. I wasn't expecting such a big book, but 
I'm happy it is so big because each page is a glossy cornucopia of information. The level ah. of detail each page contains is astounding and I've discovered many things about the base I never knew. It's well worth a purchase. You won't be disappointed. Now, my favourite thing about this is that you can actually upload a picture of your product or you with the product when you yeah. review an item on the Jerry Anderson store. And Andrew has uploaded a photo of a tray of sausage rolls. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, fair enough. I don't know why this is, but Andrew <laughs> it gave me a great giggle. Um, yeah. There's 12 there on a tray. They look fresh out the oven. They look delicious. If you've got any spare, please do chuck them my way. But there we go. Uh, Lovely. Uh, maybe that's a, a, a new scoring system. It's 12 sausage rolls uh, rated. <laughs> so that's right. I like that. brilliant. Uh, anyway, yeah, good. Th- thank you for all of your reviews and your emails and your messages and your tweets. We'd love to hear from you, wouldn't we, Dickie? Oh, always, yeah. It's what we're here for, really. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So email us, podcast at jerryanderson.com, or you can tweet us. Me, I'm Jamie Anderson, him, Richard N. James, and him over there Good. doing a one-handed handstand with his feet on the wall, Chris oh, Dalek. God, show me off sure, now. Also, make sure you use the hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast or hashtag Chris's Handstand. <laughs> I look forward to those. <laughs> no one's going to use that. That would yeah. be weird. Uh, anyway, we'll be back uh, next time with Pod 188, won't we? Ooh, won't we? Won't we? Yeah, why won't not? We? Yeah, let's Ooh, do it. That's a relief. Okay. Yeah. Um, I probably will next week share some reviews of the UFO comic anthology just because, again, very proud of the team who've put it together. Great. Uh, so ex- please excuse a, a parent's pride. Uh, you're quite right. It is, you know, <laughs> I'm doing that thing yes. of, uh, oh, you won't believe what little Johnny did last week. He's so talented. <laughs> that's right. Oh, oh, bless. Oh, dear. Can't help yeah. myself. Anyway. Sweet. Uh, thank you, Podstron, for joining us. Uh, we'll go away and leave you to uh, to dry off your clammy ear now, shall we? Yeah, let's do that. See you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. Oh, <laughs> did I hear your phone playing a little outro then? No, it's just my WhatsApp pinging away. Oh, ping, ping, ping. Wait, was yes, it, very was it exciting. exciting. It's just the family. You know what it's like. No. Oh, yeah. No, t- do you know what? It, it's my son, Toby. He's, he's WhatsApping me about Wordles. Have you heard about Wordles? No, what's a Wordle? Well, because you're not on Twitter as much as you used to be, are you? No, not really. So, well, Wordles, I, I, it seems to be this new word game that's sweeping social media. And uh, Toby, being a bit of a wordsmith, is a big fan of it. Oh. Yeah. Can you tell me how you... Uh, I think it's a bit like, I haven't played it myself, but from what I've seen, now, do you remember a, a, a board game called Mastermind, but that was nothing to do with the TV show of yes, the same name? Yes, with the coloured pegs. That's right. But you could also buy uh, a word version. Yes. Featuring little plastic letters. Right. Well, I think it's a similar concept. Oh, it's on the, it's on the telly at the minute, isn't it? Oh, oh, is it? I've no idea. I don't know. Uh, I only watch Doctor Who and Star Trek on TV, as you know. Ah, uh, so, of course. Uh, yeah, and the chase. Uh, so I think the idea is that you're given, uh, you know, a particular number of opportunities to try and find the word, and uh, the game tells you if you've got, you know, two letters in the right yeah, place, yeah. Uh, no letters, but, you know, what, what have you. Uh, and by the end of the game, you're supposed to have uh, discovered the word. Yes. Quite addictive, apparently. Yes, I'm just reading hey, it now. 300,000 people a day are playing the game. Wow. Right. Gosh. We're in the wrong line of work, aren't we, really? We are, right. Well, I'm yeah. off to sack off this podcast and go and do something with Wordle. Oh, fair enough. So it's just me next week then. Lovely. <laughs> don't mind. Thanks yeah, for fine. that. Great. Uh, good luck. Won't see you next week. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, tune in, listener, next week for the uh, Office of Orion from Space Precinct podcast. <sighs> no? Oh, just a thought. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.